good morning. Take two here at Portage First United Methodist Church as we try again to begin our live stream this morning. Sorry about that. Um, a few announcements before we begin. First of all, happy Easter. We continue in the season of Easter for just two more Sundays. And so we're looking forward to, um, to ending the Easter season next Sunday. And the f following Sunday is uh, Pentecost. Um, we want to remind you that our current date for reopening the sanctuary is June 14th. However, this is subject to change as the situation um, continues to evolve. There is a chance that we might continue in quarantine throughout the summer. Um, as we get updates, we'll be doing our best to inform you. Um, today, in fact, after our live stream, members of our safety and security team, as well as members of our staff and mus musicians, will be coming together um, six feet apart, of course, to discuss protocols for reopening. So we're working on it. We continue to try to reach out to you through every means that we have. If you have a pastoral care need, please call the church office at 219-762-3846. We want to remind you that our phone system actually has a, a, um, a choice system where you can choose to, to talk to one person at the staff, and we can receive those messages wherever we are in the world. So we are basically available to you at, at all times. Um, you may also email us at pfumccares at gmail.com. Our Sunday School lessons are already available on our F Facebook Sunday School. Further, our youth group will be meeting at 1 o'clock for their Zoom youth meeting. Um, contact Pastor Tara if you're a youth who would like to participate. Uh, while, you may have, while you've been away um, and we haven't been meeting, um, our intrepid and uh, hardworking trustees are continuing to make building repairs, and we're happy to inform you that our leaky roof will be finished being replaced next week. Um, you should, should have received a letter late last week with an update from the church, as well as some information regarding Pastor Tara's departure from us. If you haven't received anything, please call the church office on Monday and we'll make sure you get the information. Finally, we want to remind you that if you're able to continue with your tithes and offerings, you're able to do so through the Push Pay app. Just text PFUMC to the number 7797 to sign up. You can also mail in your offering to Portage First United Methodist Church, 2636 McCool Road, Portage, Indiana, 46368. We will share this information in the comments down below our video. We're happy to have with us um, some volunteers to, to worship with us today. We have Pastor Tara, Heather Schultz, Kara Reeder, um, Brendan Hur, and Todd Warren, all of whom are here today to, to lead the Church of God in worship as she is a dispersed community out in the world. So that from our church building to your house church this morning, let us join together in worship. Take it away. streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. 
brought me to the valley of vision where I live in the depths but see thee in the heights hemmed in by mountains of sin I behold thy glory let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up that to be low is to be high that the broken heart is the healed heart that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to have nothing is to possess all, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give is to receive, that the valley is the place of vision. Lord, in the daytime, stars can be seen from the deepest wells. And the deeper the wells, the brighter thy stars shine. Let me find thy light in my darkness, thy life in my death, thy joy in my sorrow, thy grace in my sin, thy riches in my poverty, thy glory in my valley. Our text this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things, from one ancestor he made all the nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed on, on, for he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, it's awfully rainy out there today. In fact, I don't know about you, but when I woke up this morning thinking I've got to go into church, I bet just a little bit part of you thought, gosh, I get to work, watch ch church in my pajamas this morning. I bet there was a small part of you out there, in the, in the, out there on Facebook Live, out there watching the live stream thinking, oh, it's nice not having to get out into the rain to go to church. You know, I was thinking just as I was, woke up yesterday, I thought, wouldn't, you know, what I wouldn't give 
to be in college right now. Walk with me for a moment. Because today would be the perfect day to hunker down with one of my textbooks and take a nap in Bracken Library at Ball State. <laughs> I know exactly where I'd go. I'd go up on the third floor to the lounge that's just a little bit to the left, the one that no one ever goes into, my personal spot. And then I'd sit there with my textbook and I'd read a chapter and then I'd nap. And then I'd read a chapter and then I'd nap and it would be awesome. There were many things about the college experience that I loved and naps in Bracken Library was per pretty much what, uh, to top of the list. But there's also sort of a sense in which um, I, I sort of miss that experience of, of walking through the quad this time of year, seeing all the beautiful trees and the landscaping and all the things they do to make you want to come there. Did it ever occur to you how beautifully landscaped colleges are? And then, you know, of course, when we go, it's fall and everything's dying, and then we spend most of the time walking in between these buildings where the landscaping looks terrible because it's winter. But they do it to make it so attractive to you when you go on those college visits, right? There is, however, one thing about my experience at Ball State that I will say was always, always dreadful. And that was going to pay my bill in Lucina Hall. Now, it's not the paying the bill part, though that's not necessarily fun. It wasn't the money or any of those things. It was the feeling you got when you walked through the door. If there was a soundtrack, it would be something like this. Da 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 da, thwomp. Da 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 da, thwomp. I mean, that, it's exactly how you walk into, the, into Lucina Hall, and there'd be a line, and I would try, y'all. I would try so hard. I, I, would, be, I would be like almost almost insanely grinny and happy and I would try so hard to get the lady who's taking the check to be nice to me and I'd, I'd stand in line and wait at the appointed place and I didn't cross the line you know you're supposed to wait behind the line and then walk up and when they call you and I would wait for them to to call me and I'd walk up oh, hello how are you today isn't it a beautiful day outside how are you and she'd be like what do you want I need to pay my bill please I don't know what her life was like. I, I don't know any of them. It didn't matter what teller you went to. I don't know what their lives were like, but it must have been awful. I tell you the truth. It just seemed like there was just such a, a sorrow over the place, a, a, a tremendous a feeling of just, I hate my job feeling, you know? And, and you, can, you, can, you can't pass that up. Like if you go to a restaurant, you know who hates their job and who doesn't, right? So I was going into this place and, and you pay your bill and it didn't matter how much I tried. Jesus wanted me for a sunbeam. By the time I walked out of there, there were clouds around my head and I carried them with me throughout the whole day. Oh, those people are so sad. I imagine it's not the same way anymore. Who knows if they even pay their bills in Lucina Hall anymore. But back in the day, there is a sense, though, that I miss parts of college that, that I don't have anymore. Like, at the end of the semester, you were done. You don't have that in life, do you? I mean, you finish something and you move on to the next thing, and nothing's ever truly, truly done. You're, you're, you, there is no end of the semester to paying your taxes, or there is no end of the semester to your job, your, your nine-to-five job that you had to every day. College provides us this moment to, to end something and start something fresh continually, and we don't have that necessarily. And, I, and the other thing that I miss is that I miss um, those moments where you learn something and it, and it electrifies you. I don't know why this is, I, I'm going to, you know, you're going to totally think that I'm just one of the nerdiest people in the world when I tell you, I remember when I learned the difference between the classical and romantic periods and how much sense that made to me and how exciting it was. I don't know why it struck me as exciting. I think it's because I was studying classical Greek at the time, and so I could see how the, the classical Greeks moved into the Roman era and the romance and the, and the, the passion of, of, the, of that period. And then I saw it echoed again in music and art. And it just, it sort of like made, this sense, made sense to me as, as history echoed in on itself. But I have noticed within the last few years I have noticed that there seems to be some sort of difficulty, some sort of struggle that Christian people are having with the process of education, especially higher education, especially public education. We 
almost seem afraid of it in some ways. There seems to be infecting the church at this current moment an anti-intellectualism, an anti-science kind of bias. And I have to tell you that today's discourse in the book of Acts, today's story shows just how antithetical that is to the Christian message, how against the Christian message this idea is. You see, we see in this moment Paul going to the Areopagus. This is a, a region of, of Greece. It's, at, right, it's within the city of Athens. And as you know, the Greeks were, were, the, were the creators of philosophy, of thinking about the world and the structure of knowing and all of those kinds of things. And, the, and they loved to argue philosophy and they loved to talk about religion. And, and they loved this process of meeting together and discussing um, difficult and, and strugglesome um, mental concepts. The Greeks loved to argue. I was just thinking and on my way into work today, in fact, that we have a Greek woman coming to join our staff in August, Janice Grafikis. She's part uh, Greek and part Hungarian, and I look forward to never winning an argument with her, with, with, with her ever, because she's, it's, it's right there in her blood. She's going to be the person who, who, who's able to, to, to argue the way those Greeks used to. And in these conversations, the people of, of Greece found life. They, they loved to debate, they loved to discuss, they loved to learn. And so you have Paul marching into their city. And what many of us forget about Paul, when we think about him, perhaps we, we think of him as a sort of a simple man, a, a tent maker by trade, but the reality is, is that Paul is actually a very, very educated man. He says of himself in, in the scriptures that he was that he taught that he learned at the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel and that he, he, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In order to be a Pharisee, he had to be a tremendous scholar of the Old Testament. He had to know the law of God frontwards, backwards and sideways. In order to be a Pharisee, he had to be a highly educated man, a highly successful man because it wasn't cheap. It wasn't easy to, to pay for the education that you needed to have in order to be a Pharisee. And Paul was one of these. Paul was a highly, highly educated man. And when God calls him, God knew that. God knew that he was not, ju that he was not just filled with passion at that point against the church that later turned into passion for the church, but he also knew that Paul was a scholar. And in that vein, God called him. And so Paul arrives in Athens, and it's very clear to me that he comes in as an observer with almost a scientific kind of precision. He says, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with, a, with an inscription. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Paul is walking through the city, and what is he doing? He's, he's observing the people and he sees that they are very religious. He's looking at their temples. He's looking at the places of their divine worship. And then he finds an altar with an inscription that reads, to an unknown God. And Paul, even though he is Hebrew, even though he is a Roman citizen, is able to read the inscription on the altar. In other words, he's able to read ancient Greek right? Which probably to him wasn't so ancient, but you know, you get the idea. This means that Paul is versed in at least three languages. His native Hebrew, right? His Aramaic Hebrew. It means that he's able to speak Latin because you can't be a Roman citizen. And Paul tells us several times that he's a Roman citizen. So this means he's able to speak Latin, like, like most of the Roman people. And he's able to speak the language of merchants in his day. He's able to speak Greek. He speaks three languages. This is not an un uneducated man. And he sees this altar there that's made to the unknown God. Now, as you may already be aware, the Greeks were polytheists. They had many gods. There was Poseidon, the god of the, the sea, Hades, the god of the underworld, Zeus, the god of the heavens, uh, Miner uh, uh, Athena, the goddess of ha handicrafts and a warrior goddess, um, tons and tons of gods, even some, some less known ones like Hecate, the goddess of magic. They're, they're well-known ones and they're less known ones and they have tons and tons of deities. And it wasn't actually so much to come up with a new one. But what happens if you have a god somewhere that hasn't revealed their, their identity and perhaps they do something nice for the city of Athens 
And uh, no one knows about it because they don't know this God's name yet. So the Athenians, being very wise, built an altar to the unknown gods and goddesses. And if something good happened to them, they would go to this altar and they'd say, thank you, unknown God. I don't know who it came from, but, uh, but I, I just want to say thanks. This was good. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Here's an offering. Please don't smite me and my family, right? And so this basic idea is that it, it sort of filled in the stopgap. Now, the church, we have something like this. Perhaps you may have heard of St. Jude, right? The patron saint of lost, lost causes, the reason that St. Jude is the, the patron saint of lost causes or the, or the, the final moment, your, your sort of Hail Mary play to get out of what situation you're in, is because there is St. Jude, but there's also Judas Iscariot. And when you were praying, you didn't want to run the risk of dialing up the wrong one. So you pray to St. Jude sparingly, only in the worst case, in case you got the wrong guy on the line. Eh, oh well. But the reality is they had this stopgap measure. They had this altar to an unknown God. They didn't know when something good happened and they didn't know who to ascribe it to, they would say thank you. And so Paul, knowing these people, understanding what they're like, goes to the Areopagus, a place where they love to gather together and to argue and to talk about um, philosophy and religion together. This was its appointed position. It's basically the coffee shop of its day. And so they go into, and so he goes into this place. He says, I see you have this altar to the unknown God. Well, guess what? What you worship is unknown, but I'm going to tell you who this unknown God is. And then he says, the God who made the world and everything in it he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in any of your shrines. And he's not made by human hands, and he's not really served by human hands in any way because he doesn't need anything. Since he himself gives all of us life and breath and all things, and from one ancestor he made all the nations that inhabit the earth, now, we've heard this story, haven't we? I mean, we remember Genesis and, and, the book and, and all of this, but Paul is telling this to the people for the same time, but for the first time. But I want you to notice something very interesting that he does here. He says, For in God, or in him, we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Paul is trying to get the people to agree to his thesis statement, we, are all, we all come from God. This is the heart of his sermon this day, and he's starting with this. He's trying to get them interested in, in the message of Jesus, and he's starting to start with, yeah, I may be Hebrew and you may be Greek, but we all are one offspring and all of us came from God. But to accomplish this mission, he uses quotes from the, from the Greek people. In him we live and move and have our being is a line of poetry from Epimenides. And Epimenides was talking about Zeus when he wrote those lines. In him, in God, we live and we move and we have our being. And then he goes on, for we too are his offspring. This is also a quote from the po poet Aratus in his poem Phenomenon. He says, and the quote from, that he's quoting is, let us begin with God, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of God. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere and everyone is indebted to God, for we are indeed his offspring. These are the words of Erotus, and he knew, Paul knew, when he used these, these Greek poets to, to make his argument, he knew that his audience would be familiar with these poets and that he could draw upon their own resources to reveal to them who God really is. And so he continues to preach in this moment, we are God's offering, offspring. We ought not to think of him like a deity made of gold and silver, but God is more than that. While God has overlooked times of human ignorance, the time has now come that you should put away your idols and worship the God in whom we live and move and have our being. And it worked. There are Christians all over Greece today. It is the primary religion of Greece. The, East, the, the Greek Orthodox Church uh, gather together um, and they have beautiful sanctuaries and they have worshiped God for 
literally hundreds of years. They worship God and uh, they worship the, and read the Bible in its native Greek. They sing um, beautiful, beautiful psalms and chants that are haunting and sit with you for, for hours. Just like that Muppet song, Mana Mana, the, the, the songs of, of the, the Greek Orthodox Church will live in your heart and in your soul and move you from one place to another. It's that kind of Christianity. It's, it's, all, it's all consuming and it is all a part of your life. And it all begins with Paul here at the Areopagus, here at this moment at Mars Hill. And why did it work? It worked because Paul took the time to educate himself about the people he was preaching to. It worked because Paul wasn't just talking, uh, wasn't just speaking ignorantly. Paul recognized and knew the people he was speaking to. He knew his ministry context. He was educated. I, I, the reality of, of the church being an advocate for education begins in the very ministry and the preaching of Paul. It begins in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus wasn't just a, a person. He wasn't just a, just a, just a, a common, you know, he, he was a carpenter, but he was also a rabbi. And that means that he spent literally hours and days studying and studying and studying to become a scholar of God's word. Where has it come from, friends? This Christian uh, admonition, uh, this Christian feeling, this, this, this idea in our culture that to be a Christian means you can't be an intellectual, to be a Christian means you can't be a scientist. Where did this come from? Where did it come from that we, we became so mistrustful of the ability to educate ourselves? Do you not remember the Methodist church was founded by a man by the name of John Wesley? He was a, pre, he was a teacher. He was a professor at, Holy, at uh, Holy Cross University. He was an Oxford graduate. He was, a, he was educated in, in everything that you can possibly imagine. He was so educated that he impressed the royalty of his day. They saw him reading, uh, reading his Bible in Hebrew as he was sitting on a, tr on, on, a, um, on, a, on a ship, and Princess Anne said, we need to pay attention to these Methodists. They are prepared, and they know what they're doing. These Methodist people gathered together in holy societies where they studied and they learned, and John Wesley said, you shouldn't just read the Bible. You should read everything you possibly can get your hands on. Plunder the Egyptians. If it is wisdom, you should seek after it. And it is that kind of wisdom that caused him to be the man that, that ignited a, a fire and a power and a rev revival that came all the way from England, all the way across the ocean, all the way around the world. And that happened because he took the time to learn and to be educated. There's a, a meme that was coming around um, a few years ago. I'm sure it's still out there somewhere because it's, it's on the internet. It's going to be there forever. But there's, there's the, it, was, it was this picture, and it said, this is the atheist church. And it showed a picture of a library. And someone I knew took that per particular picture, and they said, this is the library at Holy Cross University. And it, it's so funny because there's this idea that, that that being an intellectual is somehow atheist, atheistic, but the reality is we're the ones who built those libraries. If you want to talk about the Ivy League of all the greatest educational institutions, they all started with the church. Harvard was started by the church. Duke University is a United Methodist institution. We built Duke. It exists today because of your church. The reality is the church has always embraced education. The very work of doing theology is what happens when you take what happens in worship and you use your mind to try and discover it. Where did we get this idea that education is somehow the enemy of the Christian faith? I'll tell you where. It comes from a sense of laziness or a sense of fear of having your beliefs challenged. You see, when you have to educate yourself, when you have to learn the history of the Old Testament, when you have to, to try and, and come uh, to take the, the modern world and, and connect it to your faith, that's actually kind of hard sometimes. It actually takes some work to do it. And a lot of people don't want to do that work. There's a, a, an old poster that I've seen in youth group walls that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that's that. Well, what does it mean when you read your Bible and it doesn't tell you that slavery is evil, but instead tells you how to own slaves? What does it mean when you open your Bible and it says children who disobey their parents should be stoned to death at the city gates? What does that mean? 
Doesn't that mean you have to, to think about it, to challenge it, to struggle with it? And most people, the reality is they just don't want to do that. But as Paul admonishes us in his letter to the Philippians, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do you notice the word that he uses? Work. Because it is work. It is hard to do. And there will come moments where your faith is challenged and you're not sure which way to go or what to do. And you're not sure whether what you believe is the truth or not. And, and when you work at your salvation, sometimes you'll have doubts. And people don't like to have doubts. They like to be assured. They like to walk on with their, with their eyes closed and just know they're heading in the right direction. But the reality is, the reality of Paul's life, the reality of Jesus' life, is that working out your salvation means an awful lot of hard work, difficult work, strugglesome work. And a lot of people just don't want to do the work. The reality is, I will use one basic example. When the theory and the, the, the and when Darwin came up with this concept of, of, of evolution, the church had to rethink itself. They had to rethink what they knew about creation. And a lot of people were so terrified, they took Darwin's books and they ripped them apart. And they had book burnings and they did all these things because gosh darn it, it challenged their understanding of the world. But it's been hundreds of years since then. And we've learned and we've grown and the original fear is gone. We understand what the Old Testament looks like, what the Old Testament was trying to say, that maybe Genesis chapters 1 and 2 were not a cosmic cookbook for how to build a universe, that maybe it was making some other kind of statement about the relationship of God to the universe. Likewise, in the days of Galileo, Galileo Galilei, decided, using his, his remarkable scientific work, he, um, he, he discovered that the world was not the center of the universe, that the earth was not the center of the universe, that in fact the, the earth was surround, went around in, in revolutions around the sun. And this was such a controversial doctrine at the time because what they believed about the world was that the world had four corners. And that at those four corners were the four angels and all around the world was paradise, right? and that these angels would move the winds around the world, uh, around the, this marvelous globe, and that all around it was paradise, and underneath was damnation, and, and that's, where, that's what the world, and the, the, the world looked like. And there was even a time that the church decided we don't want to have people making maps because that challenges our beliefs. There were times that we were afraid of education, but guess what? <laughs> Galileo was right. We know a lot more about how the world works and about the, the nature of the universe and God is still God. I think many times people hate education and they hate science because deep down they have a secret fear. And here it is. They secretly fear that God will somehow be disappointing. <sighs> to that I say this. The scientist, the scholar, tries to get the whole universe into their heads, while the poet seeks to lift their head into the universe. And we are people who are called upon to open our eyes and to lift our heads into the very heart of the universe, to understand it as much as we can. This is marvelous. This is marvelous. It stands right there in the middle of Genesis, doesn't it? When, when, when God brings all the animals to Adam to see what, they will, what that he will name them, this idea of discovery, this idea of look at him, look at what I've made, look at the world I've created and be in awe. This is what we have been invited into. And I'm scared, I'm honestly scared of a church that is afraid to look around, of a church that is afraid that God isn't who God is. <laughs> When you have that moment where you learn more about the nature of the universe, when you learn more than you thought you knew, and you have to reevaluate your beliefs, it's a difficult process, but it can be done. For God is the source of all wisdom. And in God, we live and move and have our being. For we too are God's offspring. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Beyond and mis- you are beyond all we can possibly conceive. You are mysterious beyond measure. You are powerful and you are hope. And so, gracious one, we turn to you now, offering all that we are and all that we have back to you. We are not afraid to look upon the u- universe and search out its mysteries, for we know at the heart of it all stands you and your love. As Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. A strongly held belief about the goodness of who you are, God. We have it. 
we believe at the heart of it all is a God who loves and who knows us by name. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us today for our live stream. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. In nomine Patria et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.